Hello, and welcome to Stories of Scotland, a podcast celebrating Scottish heritage, culture, and folklore. I'm Jenny. And I'm Annie. And today we have another marvellous bonus episode for you that we are absolutely thrilled to be releasing. Two in a week, Annie. Two in a week. This is unheard of. (laughs) (laughs) Two bonuses as well. (laughs) So again, this episode is a little bit different from our usual format. As we are speaking to the incredible, internationally best-selling author, Diana Gabaldone. Outlander is famous as an epic time-travelling tale of loyalty and unbreakable love. And Six Packs and Kilts. As some of you may know Outlander from the TV adaption starring Sam Heughan and Katrina Balfe. Both the novels and show have had a massive influence on the Scottish tourism sector, with the Outlander effect igniting interest in Scottish heritage around the world. It's 30 years since the first Outlander was published, and the ninth book in the series, Go Tell the Bees That I Am Gone, is being released tomorrow. Tomorrow! Before we kick into the interview and meet Diana, can I share a wee bit of bee folklore with you, Jenny? Ah, I mean, you're asking, but I'm fairly sure there's no way I can stop you right now, Annie. So go (laughs) ahead. (laughs) So the title, Go Tell the Bees That I Am Gone, refers to traditional European folklore about keeping bees. Now, I love, love, love bees, our little pollinating companions. And I am so excited that Diana chose bee mythology for the title. Now, in the UK, the habit of speaking to bees is mostly recorded in England, which I've been able to find endless sources for. So as a quick introduction to the legends of bees, Jenny, please could you read this extract from the Journal of Horticulture in 1874? Bygone beekeeping. I was brought up in a small hamlet in Shropshire, where in every cottage, every occupier kept bees. The householders were chiefly farm labourers, not earning more than 10 shillings per week, and so they paid their rents from profits made on their bees. Boxes were then unknown for bees. The villagers had but few straw hives. They made hives from shoots of willows, osiers, each making their own hive in the long winter evenings. When this osier frame was sufficiently dry, They plastered the hives over with a mixture of half lime and half cow dung, and that is when they were ready for use. The women generally managed the bees, so the people had the notion that the bees would not work for two masters. If a member of the family died, someone had to go and tell the bees. Otherwise, it was thought that all the bees would die. This is such a good introduction to talking to the bees. So I've also managed to find a source from 200 years ago that discusses a household mourning a lost family member. And at the funeral, first they would serve wine and biscuits to the bees in their garden. Aw, imagine how a tiny bee wine goblet would look. So I don't think the bees were actually invited to the table. (laughs) Little tiny, tiny little knives and forks. Look at that. Tiny little condiments. No one wants a dry cracker. (laughs) (laughs) I suppose suppose that's honey. They would put honey on there. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, beehive, Jenny. Um, I'm in a bit of a sticky situation here, Annie, I'll be honest. (laughs) Um, No, they would actually mash the biscuit and the wine together and place it under or beside the beehive while explaining to the bees that one master had passed away and asking them if they would serve a new member of the family. In a lot of the legends, the bees won't just accept being told something once. They need to hear it three times for it to be true. And in one case... The family have to give the bees a small piece of silk as a funeral shroud. I see the bees' tactic. They're like, wait, if we hold off, we can get more wine and biscuits. (laughs) (laughs) 
But it does make sense. Why bother inviting them to the funeral without giving them suitable mourning attire? <laughs> the silk was just tied to the hive. But anyway, it was also a superstition that the bees could sense when misfortune was on the horizon. And then they would lower the noise of their hum to warn their beekeeper that there was danger ahead. However, bee customs are not all based in tragedy because bees also enjoy celebrations. And so there's also a wonderful superstition that I've seen mentioned in Scotland that a bride should tell the bees of her wedding on the day of her wedding in order to ensure a happy future. So you're almost getting a blessing from the bees. Could this then possibly relate to some folklore about the west of Scotland that I know, where bees were associated with wisdom and uh, a sacred knowing? There's a half-remembered phrase from a Victorian writer called William Sharp that tells us to ask the wild bee what the druids know. And this connects our humble bees to ancient lore. And so, in a way, bees are the messengers between our mundane old world and the supernatural realm, the perfect extras for the new Outlander. So shall we ask the bees to get Diana on the line? Just a quick thanks to our sponsors of this episode, Scotland Shop. Scotland Shop make beautiful tartan clothing with a story behind every product. And your tartan garments can be custom made to fit your body shape. While based in the borders, their tartans are available worldwide. Follow the link in the episode description and see their wide range of tailored tartan clothing and fabrics. There are over 500 clan tartans to choose from. 500! And you can make a virtual appointment for some personal service from the comfort of your own sofa. Your own sofa! Jenny! I think you'd look great in one of their tailored suits. I agree, Annie. I'll head over to Scotland Shop via the link in the episode description after the show. Thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure. Now, let's see, what should I tell you? (laughs) Well, let's see. My name is Diana Gabaldon. I am the author of, amongst other things, the Outlander series of novels, of which the ninth book Go Tell the Bees That I Am Gone has just been published. It will be released on uh, November 23rd. And everyone is, uh, I know, waiting, at least I hope they're waiting, with keen anticipation to see what it's like. So I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing what everyone has to say about it. This is always, you know, the thrill of a new book, you know, and people who have never read it before are like, uh, or, uh, oh my God, I can't believe you did that. You know, or why did you do that? You know, it's like like that. But, you know, (laughs) it's uh, nice to get a rise out of people one way or the other. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. And the ninth book in the Outlander series. That's incredible. Um, I think 30 year anniversary, is it? I think so, yes. <laughs> I read that there was a sort of 10 book series you have planned, or are you quite happy to to see what happens? Well, I don't really plan the books. You know, I just sort of, uh, I put them together in pieces, you know, as, as they occur. I don't begin with an outline. I don't write with in a straight line. I write in bits and pieces and I put them together. And so I don't really know whether a book is the final bit of a series until we come quite close to the end. And then I can say, oh no, there's quite a bit more, you know, well, after another one. But I think at the moment that book 10 would in fact be the final thing. On the other hand, I thought number three was going to be the final thing and yeah, it wasn't. So, <laughs> you know, I'll just have to wait and see. On the other hand, I will be 17 in January. So, you know, who knows how long I will last. <laughs> if we go back to the to the roots of Outlander, obviously it's very deeply entrenched in Scotland. And a lot of people are really surprised to find out that when you first wrote Outlander, you hadn't been to Scotland at all. Oh, I was in the middle of the second book, Dragonfly in Amber. Yeah, I wrote Outlander for practice, you know, in order to learn how to write a novel. And so I was not telling anyone that I was doing it. <laughs> and, you know, actually, I hadn't the money to go to Scotland in any case. And I had three small children. I couldn't leave my husband and say, well, I've got to go see Scotland because I'm writing this book I hadn't told you about. You know, so, <laughs> And, you know, there's no uh, telling that anyone would ever want to publish it. I didn't intend to show it to anyone, but, you know, things happen. Anyway, I did write it. It did get published. Uh, they gave me a three book contract. And so I said to my husband, well, I think I really must go and see Scotland now. <laughs> And so uh, we left the children with my parents and we went to Scotland for two weeks. 
and rented a car, drove everywhere, saw everything we could find, you know, walked all of the battlefields and collected a massive amount of books and things like that, which I'll haul back with me. Mind you, this was 1992. And we hauled everything back home to Scottsdale, where I continued writing. And, you know, here we are. <laughs> How did it feel when you first visited Scotland? Did anywhere particularly surprise you? Because you'd done so much research before coming across. Mm -hmm. It was sort of the opposite. I was deeply moved by the fact that it didn't surprise me. I felt very much like coming home. Oh, that's quite beautiful. So many people I know who feel the connection to Scotland through your Outlander books feel like they've got a really special connection to the place. Were there any historic sites that you visited on any of your research trips that you feel particularly connected to? Well, I mean, there's Culloden, you know, that place affects everyone who sets up foot on it, connected or not. Hmm, I don't know, it's mostly just the site of the mountains, I'd say. I grew up at the foot of a mountain, and uh, so I have a, a deep connection to heights <laughs> and rocks and things like that. I've always had a close connection with rocks. The Clayboat Cairns was one of the first places that we went to when we began our researches in the highlands and so forth. And, you know, that was uh, was very mystical. Uh, a lot of people find it that way, presumably including the people who built it. <laughs> what was most striking about it at the time was that at least when we went in the early 90s, there were a number of rags, including rags, tied in the trees all the way around. And I knew what they were and what they were for. I was telling my husband, I was like, I've never seen anything like that. You're speaking my language when it comes to rocks. I am somewhat obsessed. I think Scotland is a fantastic place for geology, but also visually, the mountains really do pull you in. Uh, I am the sort of person who, when I'm out walking, especially by myself, and I do walk every day, you know, exercise and clear my brain and all that, but I tend to pick up rocks, you know, just uh, you know, a rock that strikes my fancy at the time. And I always come home with one or two rocks in my pocket. <laughs> You know, and I'll walk around with one rock for several days and then I'll leave it, you know, on a, on a dresser or something. And after a while, I have this little heap of rocks and a nice person who cleans my house, you know, tidies them up and, you know, finds a nice little dish and puts them all in there. Of course, she thinks I'm mad you know, and doesn't know why I'm collecting all these rocks. But, you know, every once in a while, I will take, you know, a handful or so and release them back into the wild. <laughs> be, be free. <laughs> Fly away. <laughs> I like that as well. I like uh, thinking I'm building my own tidy mountain in my back garden. <laughs> they all sort of move outside after a while. Well, you know, rocks actually do move, you know, on a molecular level. They just move very, very slowly. <laughs> mm -hmm. With Scotland, you can feel that movement almost. Well, you can. The landscape is so rugged and ancient. No, you totally can, yeah. It's very emotive, the landscape. It is, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we love that you chose to set such an emotive love story in Scotland. What do you think it is about Scotland that has drawn so many love stories to it? You know, it almost seems like the perfect setting for one. Yeah, uh-huh. Well, there's a lot of room, for one thing. You know, there's a great deal of spaciousness. Emotions can expand. I mean, you can have little drawing room drama kind of romances. Those with dukes and things are very, very popular. And I see the appeal and so forth. But it's a quite different appeal to having, you know, wildness right at hand and becoming a part of it. And there's also magic there. Yeah. We love how much folklore as well is woven through Outlander, especially sort of with your time traveling. And there's a lot of time travel in Celtic folklore. Did you look up folklore and sort of draw inspiration from that as well? Oh, yes. Yeah, no, that's why I named Craig Nodoon that, you know, specifically because of the legends of people being taken into a fairy dune and not coming out for 200 years. <laughs> that sort of thing. Yeah. Do you still look up mythology? Oh, yes. Does that still take up a, a large part of your research? Uh, yeah, uh -huh. it depends, you know, where that part of the story is set and so forth. There's a good bit of Native American mythology and so forth, which I touch on only lightly, partly because I'm not personally associated with the particular Native peoples that I'm writing about, you know, and so I hesitate to go too deeply into things that I don't truly understand. Whereas Scottish folklore is... It's fairly well established, you know, I'm not going to step on anyone's toes by, you know, quoting things that have been in print for hundreds of years. It's just a matter of familiarity and also suitability to the story. If I were writing something that was set actually within a Mohawk community, I would do a great deal more research and talk to a lot more people 
And at the same time, you know, I try to do my best to render the language and everything as correctly as I can. Correctly is always a relative term when you're talking about language, though, because there are local idioms, there are local accents to people just because they come from the same culture. They're not necessarily speaking exactly the same language, and they will have very specific ideas as to, you know, how you would say this or express that, and it may be quite different from someone else, and yet they're equally Scots. For instance, Kathy Ann McPhee, who I believe is a well-known presenter for BBC Alba, and a wonderful singer. She has been helping with the Gaelic for several of my books now, along with her friend, Kathy McGregor, who is a Canadian and modestly calls herself a Gaelic learner, which means she knows more than I or any other 10 people would ever learn in our lives. So they, between them, do the Gaelic for my books. But I was talking you know, some years ago in Inverness, and I was explaining that Kathy Ann had supplied most of, of my Gaelic, and <laughs> they began laughing. And I said, is that funny? And I said, yes, yeah, she comes from Barra, and we can tell from your Gaelic, you know, that someone from Barra supplied it. <laughs> <laughs> so there is, even in those small bits of Gaelic, there's enough local idiom for people to pick it up. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and that being so, you know, you can never tell can't say for sure this is the correct way to say that because it might be correct for some people not for others from the same culture you do the best you can and you solicit information from a number of different people and try to mix and match a bit from the very beginning i solicited french you know from people who should know french like a professor of french from the university of texas and then actual french people and invariably someone will write to me about how bad the french is if I got this particular expression from an actual French person, you know, who lives in Paris and so forth, all of the people who live in Quebec will be going, that's not right, French. <laughs> no, nobody talks like that. <laughs> Whereas if I'm using a French that was given to me by Quebecois, all the people in France are going, <laughs> So, you know, you just sort of take it with a grain of salt. You do, do the best you can and hope for the best. <laughs> Everyone knows that Outlander has had a tremendously good impact on the Scottish tourism industry. I'm very happy about that. I was born in the Highlands and I'm a Gaelic learner. And I think Outlander has encouraged such an amazing amount of people to pick up Gaelic just from the kind of sprinkling that's throughout books. And that's, it's so important. And I, I think it's such a beautiful impact of the series and encouraging people from across the world to learn some Gaelic. How important for you is Gaelic within the series? Well, extremely important, sufficiently so that when the TV show was done, I talked to them about it and they said, well, we we totally agree. We have to have actual Gaelic. And so they engaged a Gaelic speaker to train uh, the actors who would need to be speaking it. And (laughs) Ron Moore, the showrunner early on, he sent me this little film clip that he had taken on his phone in the dialect coach's office. And it was of Sam Hewen, you know, trying to memorize his Gaelic lines as he was in there in his T-shirt, you know, concentrating fiercely with his arms on the table. And he, he kept going, I have to learn this, you know, I can't learn this. <laughs> <laughs> he did learn it, though, and did a very good job. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm very moved, uh, you know, by what you say about the spread of Gaelic. When I began writing, I understood that I needed to have some Gaelic because that was what people were actually speaking, and I couldn't just make it up. Yet I lived in Phoenix, Arizona, and Gaelic speakers are very thin on the ground there, especially in the 1980s. So, you know, I finally tracked down Steinhoff's Foreign Books in Boston, which is a bookseller, and this was well before the internet even existed. Anyway, I told them I needed a book of Gaelic English dictionary, and they immediately said, Scottish Gaelic or Irish Gaelic? And I said, aha, I found you at last. Yes, I need Scottish Gaelic. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) So they sent me this uh, youth-in dictionary. I used that for Outlander. And then, as I say, in the middle of Dragonfly, we went to Scotland, and I got a much bigger and better (laughs) Gaelic English dictionary and used that. Well, after the second book, I got this wonderful letter from a gentleman named Ian McKinnon Taylor. And he said, you know, I've been reading your books and I'm so moved and gratified to see the, you know, the history and culture of my country handled so well. He has, uh, was an expatriate from the Isle of, of Lewis, who was uh, working in New Hampshire at the time. And he said, you've handled everything you know, sensitively and accurately. It's, it's just wonderful. He said, there's this one thing that I hesitate to mention, but I think you must be getting your Gaelic from a dictionary. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> 
they laughed and said, well, that's surprisingly perceptive of you. Yes. And anyway, and I explained where I got that. And he said, well, it's not that the words you're using are wrong precisely, but you're not using them grammatically or idiomatically the way that a real Gaelic speaker would use them. And he said, you know, I hesitate to offer for fear of seeming presumptuous, but could I help you with that? And I said, where have you been all my life, Mr. Taylor? <laughs> so Ian helped me with that, you know, for the next several years. And so it has been very authentic Gaelic all the way through, but we've got the Isle of Lewis, the Isle of Berra, and Quebec style Gaelic going on in it, as well as some few contributions from Adam O'Broin, who is the Gaelic consultant to the Star Show, who has also supplied the odd uh, phrase here and there. But what I'm thinking here is of something that Ian said to me in, in an early letter. It was about Gaelic, and he said that he was afraid that the language would be dead in 15 years because so few people spoke it. Mm-hmm. And um, hmm. you have to pardon me, I mush up about anything, so... It's okay. I'm easily moved. Well, what I said to him was, well, if Gaelic does die, it won't be because either of us didn't try. So we tried. Yeah. I think you can safely say that you have a huge impact on Gaelic speaking across the world. Well, I don't suppose it was only me, but... (laughs) If you were to take that in the new Duolingo app, you know, people suddenly have an interest sparked and then access to sort of grow in that. Access, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a big difference, yeah. Because, as I say, it was very hard to find anything in Gaelic from where I lived at the time. And the internet has really made the globe accessible to a lot of people. For me, one of the big things that kind of switched in my brain when I first watched Outlander was that you've just got this kind of embroidery of Gaelic throughout and it makes Gaelic accessible in a way that I hadn't often seen on television before because you're still getting the English text and you're understanding what's happening but then you keep being introduced to little pieces of Gaelic and I think that introduction you didn't actually see very much even in Scottish TV it would be either completely English or completely Gaelic and you had no middle ground Outlander acts as a kind of invitation for people to really engage with that culture and that's something that's really really quite special oh yes yeah no you're exactly right in fact when they were doing the the show to begin with there was a lot of discussion about whether to use subtitles for the Gaelic because, you know, it doesn't sound like anything people are familiar with. They wouldn't be able to translate it for themselves. And I was dead against that. I said, no, that will ruin the illusion. You need to be seeing what Claire sees and feeling what she sees. She's totally confused. She has no idea what these people are saying. And it should be like that for the audience as well. But it should seem absolutely organic and natural to the actors who are actually speaking Gaelic. And Ron agreed with me about that, and they did that. But they did a wonderful job with the writing of the show to cause that effect that you're noticing. They chose scenes in which you could tell by what was happening what was being said, rather than having to translate the literal words. It's quite obvious as a spectator what's going on, (laughs) and you don't need to understand the words, but the fact that the words are being spoken really immerses you. It was so sensitively but warmly handled in the show, Yes, I agree. And it's a delight to see. And I still, I see Outlander influence just in everyday life. I was volunteering at the Highland Folk Museum a couple of years ago, and I could see people reenacting scenes as they were walking through the Highland Folk Museum village. Oh, that's lovely. (laughs) And we both live so close to Claudin Battlefield. We always see flowers being left on the Fraser gravestone. And that's because your fans have such an incredible emotional connection to the book. I'd love to ask you about the materiality in Outlander, because you do a great job as a writer of just really drawing people into whatever environments that you're you're taking them into. Oh, as as far as the sense of immersion, that's kind of a double-ended thing. I get the sense of immersion from reading things that are written by Scottish people, whether translated Gaelic or actually modern novels, because it's a question in uh, linguistic circles, is Scots, is that an actual separate language unto itself, or is it a dialect of English? And I asked a woman uh, who I knew at at the university where I was speaking, she was the head of the English department, and she was English, and I said, come across this controversy, what's your opinion? (laughs) And she said, well, it depends. She said, 
if you're Scots, then of course it's a separate language. She lowered her voice and looked around and she said, if you're English, it's not. <laughs> so, yeah, that sounds about like you know, the attitude I expected. But so anyway, I would acquire sort of a sensibility, you might say, from immersing myself in work that is done by Scottish people. And the echo kind of lingers with you, regardless of what the overall material is. Andrew Griggs novels, for instance, they're very lyrical, very poetic, and they have a really strong Scottish resonance. And then there's Irvin Welsh, who has a really different <laughs> resonance, but he's also equally Scottish. So I read all of those. And Ian Rankin, who again is something different. But I read all the Scottish writers who come across my path. I don't always go looking for them. They find me. And other than that, what I use to create that sense of immersion it's more a technical thing, and you do it partly by just providing a number of small details that are descriptive. But you know, you can't just dump details on people. That's not how it works. What I use is actually a technique I call underpainting. If you have a scene and it consists of action and dialogue, like a film script, and you can say, he did this, he saw that, he's, he said this in response, he said that in reply. Okay, that one has no underpainting to it. These people could be doing this particular thing anywhere. So what you do is, he said this, turning to look out of the window, and uh, you know that gives you a little twist of action, and suddenly you're wondering, what is he seeing out the window? And then you say, he saw McTavish coming up the garden path, his kilt swinging with suppressed fury. <laughs> and you see that. And then when McTavish comes in, you're already expecting him to be belligerent. But it's that kind of thing. You're still in the head of the person who is seeing and talking, but you're seeing so much more when you do that. You can take the underpainting out of a scene and you'll still get the actual sense of what was happening, who said what, etc. But you won't get that sense of immersiveness, which you will if you do that little back and forth of underpainting all the way through. Uh, the thing is that it's very tedious and time consuming to do that. And it also results in a much bigger book than you would get if you didn't do it. <laughs> so that is the impression that it creates, is that you are actually where the author wants you to be. How do you deal with writer's block? Do you ever get writer's block? No, I never do. <laughs> this is partly because <laughs> of the way I began writing. I was a scientist in my previous career. And, you know, I'd always known I was meant to be a novelist, but I didn't actually start until I was 35, at which point I said Mozart was dead at 36. Maybe you better start <laughs> if you want to get anywhere. Up to that point, I had written all kinds of things, mostly nonfiction, but some non. I wrote comic books for Walt Disney, for instance, Uncle Scrooge, Donald Duck, Mickey Mouse, which are presumably fiction. I mean, unless you think Donald Duck is real, which I kind of do. <laughs> And I wrote uh, you know, grant proposals and scholarly journal articles. I had begun a, sort of a separate freelance career along with my university job where I wrote stuff for the computer press because I had accidentally developed this odd expertise in scientific and technical software, which nobody else had in the mid-80s. So I got immediate assignments from all the Byte Info World PC magazine. And within a year, I was making more money doing that than I was at my university career, though I kept the university job as well. But the thing is, I needed to be doing all these different kinds of writing, including, you know, bits of technical writing, journal articles, plus the more creative stuff. And then when I started working on Outlander, the novel writing, because my only rule there was that I would write something on the novel five days out of the week. I couldn't commit to doing it every single day because, you know, you can't, you get tired, things happen. So I figured any five days out of the week, I would manage to write something. And I had, before this happened, developed the habit of writing multiple things at once because I think this is common to most writers. I stick at a certain point, no matter what I'm writing, fiction, nonfiction, journal article, rep proposal, which is deadly dull. I stick two thirds of the way down the page. I can get that far fairly easily. And then Mike had no idea what happens next. Okay, no, the common response to this is to get up and leave. You know, you go outside, take the dog for a walk off and you don't come back, which is why people don't finish their books. Well, I couldn't do that because I had to keep delivering these, these things in order to make a living. And so, what I did was I would be writing a grant proposal when it stuck. I would immediately take the next software review assignment off my stack and begin writing that software review. I'd then check back with the grant proposal if that was still stuck, and often it was. Then I would open up the panel for today's novel writing and take that up wherever I was at the beginning of a scene, in the middle of the scene, wherever. And I would work on that one until it stuck. And so I would usually have three or four documents open at once of completely divergent types of writing, but I would just shift immediately from 
one to the other whenever I hit that sticking spot. And the shift kept me writing and productive. So I would end the night with two pages of a, of a grant proposal and half of a software review and a page and a half of the novel and a draft of you know, something else, like a you know, software manual. So it kept me being very productive. And so I've never had writer's block because I just know if I hit a sticking spot, you know, go and do something else, but writing, yeah, keep writing and then check back periodically and it will come unstuck. You're the back of your mind is still working on it. Even if, if you're not consciously working on it, your mind hasn't forgotten what you're doing. Whereas if you get up and seek distraction and you go off and cook dinner or, or you talk to your husband or go out and take the dog for a walk, your mind's going to go somewhere else. It's not going to stay with, with the writing. <laughs> Just a couple of silly questions and then maybe a couple of serious ones because I realize we've got limited time here. If you could go back in time to when you were first writing the very first Outlander, what advice would you give your younger self? I can't think of anything that I would change about what I did then because I had only two rules for myself. This is I was uh, I was an experienced professional writer at that point. I had all the nuts and bolts. I I could write and I could produce clear, beautiful sentence and all that. This was not a problem, and I knew I could tell stories. I did not know if I could write a novel, and that's what I was endeavoring to try. So I said, I've got only two rules. One of those is that I will not stop, no matter if I think what I'm doing is is terrible. I'm not going to just throw it away and stop. I will continue because I need to learn how to write this novel. I don't expect that I will be perfect right now. Do it. But if I don't keep doing it, I will not be perfect. And you know, nobody ever is perfect. But I said, I will keep doing it no matter what until I finish this novel. And then I'll see what I think. So I said, I will not quit. The second rule was I will do the absolute best that I can every day. Because if you're not doing your best, how are you going to get any better? It's like being an athlete or an aspiring athlete or a professional athlete. You keep trying, you know, maybe you keep tripping over yourself until you find out a new way of jumping or whatever, but you keep doing it. And, you know, maybe you draw back and you think about it a little bit and then you try something different, but you are still doing it. You have to do the best that you can. And so those are still my rules. I love this answer. Absolutely regretting nothing at all. (laughs) And, you know, your, your younger self doesn't need advice because she's doing great. Just powering through. Well, that's pretty much it. Yeah, it was it was fine. <laughs> no, and I love those rules as well. I think I'm going to try and apply them to our podcast writing because if I go back to our first episode, <laughs> I'm like, change it all, change it all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you can change it, but... <laughs> But I mean, you learned from it. What you're doing now is is much better than what you could do then. But you were doing the best you could then. And that's how you got to where you are now. (laughs) Yeah, it's definitely an evolution. And do you feel you're still evolving as a writer? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And what I'm doing now is substantially more difficult than what I was doing then, because then it was, well, it was experimental. But also, um, since it was experimental, I was using a very well-established spine for the story. It is a, a classic romance, which is a form that goes back to the Middle Ages and has been popular ever since, and probably before people started writing it down. But I read a lot of everything, and I've read a a great number of romance novels. Uh, Some are great, some are not so great, but they all have that same classic formula. People don't like to hear that they're writing with a formula, God forbid. But by formula, I just mean you can recognize the familiar elements of this. And so I had that kind of behind and under the story as I was telling a love story. And regardless of what the actual happenstances and so forth, that story pattern was still underlying this. Okay, when I finished Outlander, I realized there was more to this story. Uh, Normally in, I mean, romance novels are one-offs. They never have sequels because once the couple is together, it's assumed that they aren't interesting anymore. (laughs) And the writer has to go and start over with a new couple and all that. And this was not what I had in mind at all. So I was going to go on with these people, but I was going to go on past the spot where a normal romance would stop. I had a three book contract (laughs) for one thing. And I said, all right, what happens next? This is uh, terra incognita. So I had to figure out what exactly were we doing. And this evolves with each successive novel because, uh, you know, I'm getting older and the people in the books are getting older. There are things in the later books that I could not have written when I was younger because I didn't have the experience. And so those older, more mature books contain my experimental stuff that, you know, I may not have known exactly how to do at the time, but I, I did it as well as I could. And consequently, it is at a higher level and more complex than the earlier books that came before it. Readers evolve as well. 
And so I will occasionally have a fairly young reader come to me and say, I love your books, but I just couldn't get through Fiery Cross. You know, it just didn't speak to me. And I said, you're too young for it. I said, try it again in five years and see what you think. And frequently they will write back to me in five years and say, well, you were right. You know, <laughs> it seems like a completely different book. And I said, you're a completely different person. You're old enough now that you identify with what that book is about. Mm -hmm. And this is why the books become different as I grow older and uh, Jamie and Claire grow older. They don't die yet. They don't change in their essence, but their attitudes and their responses and their feelings about themselves, these change and evolve. If we return to my time machine, uh, my TARDIS, if you will, if we could go back in time to any moment in Scottish history, when would you choose? Oh my God, I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's very turbulent history, and I think it would be really dangerous to go back to any of the really interesting times. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I really wouldn't time travel because, you know, I like my husband and I would leave him. I enjoy my life. You know, I don't want to leave that. And besides, time traveling is really dangerous. You know, you don't want to do that if you don't have to. So your advice to all potential time travelers is not to time travel. Yeah, don't do it. <laughs> well, you know, I can't stop them. <laughs> If, they, uh, if that's their idea of a good time, you know, feel free. But... <laughs> oh, yeah, just just don't say that to Claire, or we'd never have had these marvelous books. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if she had any idea what was going to happen, she might have had second thoughts too. <laughs> As it was, she didn't have a choice. So, <laughs> and I've just got another silly one before we have. Uh, end on a nice serious question so if you were to have a dinner party and you get a guest from Scottish history a creature from Scottish mythology and one character from Outlander which three would you choose? <laughs> <laughs> well I might pick since it's from Scottish history rather than a necessarily Scottish character I might pick David Rizzio you know the secretary of Mary Queen of Scots who was murdered in front of her by her husband who was hoping to scare her into having a miscarriage. Anyway, I don't know if you read it or not, but Dame Denise Mina has just come out with a new book called Rizzio, which is a, it's a great job. It's historical fiction, but told with her inimitable sense of language. Really, really interesting. So I think I would like to have him. He was a very interesting, complex character, and I would really like to hear his court gossip. <laughs> As for... Uh, character from mythology mm. but I don't think you would want to deal with most of the other folk they're very sly and sneaky and you wouldn't trust them at your dinner table I don't know it might be a translation problem but I'd go for uh, for Nessie <laughs> <laughs> a dinner by the law <laughs> exactly yeah so the water side you could just poke her head out and you know, join in the conversation and the other one was an outlander character mm -hmm. uh, one of the Scottish outlander characters or just anybody Anybody. I feel like it covers so much area and land and so many characters. I'd probably choose Lord John, you know, because he's so polished in manner. He could have a dinner party with the Loch Ness Monster without turning a hair. You know? <laughs> <laughs> know exactly what to say. <laughs> For impeccable manners. If it was one of the Scottish characters, though, hmm, I think maybe Jenny Murray, Jamie's sister. Mm -hmm. She's a very no-nonsense character, and she's very perceptive. You know, her commentary would be extremely good. <laughs> and I think she and David Rizzio might have more in common than one might think. <laughs> <laughs> Marvellous. I think that would be a fabulous dinner party, just out of curiosity, because at the moment with COP26, we keep seeing famous international travellers trying Iron Brew. Have you tried Iron Brew? Once. <laughs> yeah, no, I had my suspicions. I was going, <laughs> anyway, I tried it. It tastes like orange cough syrup. It's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to plan what we'd be serving at this dinner party. <laughs> Well, you know, if haggis was in season, that would be good. A nice haggis. But, you know, a good, uh, good haggis would be nice. I personally would go for Highland venison, which I'm very fond of. I think that would be great. We spoke a lot early on in an interview about the kind of impact that Outlander has had on, on Scottish tourism, on Scottish Gaelic, on historic sites. What legacy do you hope for the Outlander series to have? I really don't know. You know, I honestly don't know. So many people have at least started reading it. And uh, now that it's spread via television and so forth, that's kind of circular in that a great many people are coming to the books via the show to start with because, you know, television has a much broader reach than print does. 
So that's going to affect, you know, also the readers that we get and that they will be principally <laughs> television people. And one of the effects there is that we're getting many, many more male readers because one of the difficulties with writing a book that has no genre is that it's very, very difficult for publishers to know where to put it. And back when I wrote Outlander and the few succeeding books, there was no internet, there was no Amazon. We had only bricks and mortar stores. A bookstore has shelves with labels on them and a book can only go on one shelf with one label. So the original publishers were forced to try to decide what are we going to sell this as? And so they not unreasonably, but objectionably, decided to call it a romance. And okay, the first book has the spine of a classic courtship story. The others don't. And as I say, romances are one-offs. This is the you know, uh, increasing sequels, you know, as far as the eye can see. And also, if you look at, well, there's the category romances, which are quite small. These are the ones you buy in the grocery store, Mills and Boone, Harlequins, and so forth, which are an art form unto themselves. And when you find a good one, it's really good. Like anything else, some of them are not that good. And then there's the more standard, what are called single title, which, you know, run 80 to 100,000 words. The historical ones are the 100,000 words ones. Some of those are excellent, but again, they are that standard story. And they stop, you know, when the characters come together. I realized immediately that I was not telling that kind of story. I said, this is a you know, old and more or less respected literary form, but it is a very common one, and lots of people do it. I've seen it done, you know, very, very well in many, many iterations. I said, I have never seen anyone attempt uh, literarily to explain not what makes people fall in love, because everybody's interested in that, but everybody knows what makes people fall in love. I said, uh, what makes people stay married for 50 years? I'd like to tell that story. Mm-hmm. It is. It's such a wonderful love story. And I think if you're going to have a legacy of anything, let it be love. Well, I hope so. Yeah. (laughs) We've just got a couple of minutes left. So just on the final question, we are so excited about the upcoming release of Go Tell the Bees that I'm gone. Can I just ask you, where did you learn about the language of bees? I've just discovered this folklore and I think it's, it's tremendously fun. So could you share share the bee language. Oh, (laughs) well, I discovered that in my career as a biologist, because one of the books that we read as, you know, an assigned text in one of my classes as a graduate student, I can't remember which one, but it was E.O. Wilson's uh, Social Insects. And he was discussing bees primarily, but also ants and termites, which are the third batch of social insects and not the ones you want in your house. But that was the first analytical look, as far as I know, of how bees actually communicate physically and what they're saying. Well, that was deeply interesting to just about anybody. And I remembered it. And so, you know, just in my general reading, whenever I picked up a mention of bees or, you know, further scientific investigations and so forth, or anecdotal things, I would read it. I've always just kind of had bee lore buzzing in the background, you might say, when I was doing research for the novels. Of course, I came across mentions of beekeeping because it was very common in both in the British Isles and Scandinavia and Germany and in all the parts where people keep bees. And so there was a certain amount of, you know, lore surrounding beekeeping legends and myths, probably prayers about keeping bees and what do you say to your bees and so forth. And that, of course, is where the title comes from is because bees are social insects and a good beekeeper visits his or her hive every day to you know look after them make sure there's no wasps or ants bothering them and tend them in general and while you're there you talk to the bees because you want them to know it's you and not a bear so they won't sting you and to be accustomed to your voice and and uh, so you talk to them and they are social insects so they care about what's happening in the community around them so you give them the news you tell them well you know we have a new neighbor she's just moved in last week I think she's going to be nice and she's planted hollyhocks out front you'll like that you know so and so that you that you know of who used to live up the hill he's died I'm afraid and his sons don't seem to be at all interested in gardening so maybe you don't want to fly up that way today because the legend is that if you withhold any juicy bit of news from your bees and they find out about it they will be angry and they'll swarm and fly away so you always tell the bees when anybody comes into your community when anybody leaves so people say to me oh that's a very sinister title I'm afraid someone's going to die is Jamie going to die I'm going you don't you don't know (laughs) I'm not going to tell you but it doesn't necessarily mean anybody's going to die it just says they're gone You know, maybe they went to Salisbury to shop. Maybe they went to Albany to talk to the Mohawk. Maybe they got on a ship and sailed back to Scotland. We won't know until we find out. 
and we will find out on November 23rd. We'll find out as well, and I hope you enjoy the experience. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for speaking to us today. It was my pleasure. Again, a huge thank you to Diana for having a chat with us. Go Tell the Bees That I Am Gone is released tomorrow, November 23rd, so Outlander fans can dive back into the adventures of Jamie and Claire. If you are new to our podcast, then why not have a scroll through our back catalogue full of stories of Scottish folklore, history and wonder. And if you are a regular, then welcome back to our storytelling tavern. Please do give us a review if you enjoy the show, as reviews help us to grow. And if you're intrigued and would like to hear more Scottish storytelling content, why not join our Patreon? For the price of a jar of honey, but not Manuka honey because that is extortionate, you can help us share these incredible stories with the world. Until next time, my friends, Slangeva. Slangeva. We always end an episode with a Slangeva, so just a little Gaelic saying, can you give us your best, Slangeva? Slangeva. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> You're very welcome.